morning. <clears throat> Pardon me, it's a joy to be with you. John said, uh, surprisingly, amazingly, this is the fourth time I've been here. I guess the amazement is on my part that he'd continue to invite me. Uh, but I appreciate uh, the invitation to join you. John thinks that he's going to graduate in the not-too-distant future. Uh, we'll see about that. I, uh, I'm enjoying putting the squeeze on him and seeing him sweat uh, a little bit. You think I'm kidding. Uh, I invite you to turn, please, in your Bibles to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. I'll be reading from the New International Version. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. John tells me I can speak as long as I like, but at 1045 a trap door opens <laughs> and I disappear. The alarm clock rang at 830 in the morning. Mrs. Smith leaned on her side of the bed, the bed stand, and turned off the alarm. She nudged her husband and said, it's time to get up. We need to get going. So the wife got up and she got dressed and she looked in on the kids and woke them up and started getting breakfast ready and she went back into the bedroom because she hadn't seen her husband and there he is lying in bed. And she said, Did, didn't you hear me? It's, it's, it's time to get up. We need to get going. So she busied herself with some other tasks and looked in on him because he hadn't put in an appearance. She goes back in the bedroom and he's still there. And sh she said, get up. What's wrong with you? And he said, you know, I've been lying here thinking. I'm not going to church today. He said, in fact, I'll give you a couple of reasons why I'm not going. He said, I, uh, the people aren't friendly. I don't think they, they like me. I don't think I have many friends there. And secondly, the preacher's boring. Sermons are boring. <clears throat> it's so predictable. Three points in a poem, and then we go home and do the same thing next week. I'm just not going. Well, his wife was amazed at this. She'd never heard this before. She said, well, let me give you two reasons why you need to get out of bed right now and get up and get ready and go to church. First of all, you need to be the spiritual leader of this home. Assume some leadership. Don't send your children to church, but be an example and take them. And secondly, you're the pastor. You're preaching in 30 minutes. <laughs> I remember vividly standing at my home church, singing the words that were broadcast on the big screen in front of me, it is well with my soul. It didn't take very long for me to come to my senses and realize that I had to stop singing. It was not well with my soul. I was angry at my daughter, and if you have a teenage daughter or son, I already have your sympathy. But it wasn't just her. There were issues at work and issues at life. It was a perfect storm of events. It was a confluence of events that were troubling me, and it was not well with my soul. And for me to stand there and continue to sing with a smile on my face, I would have been the biggest fraud and hypocrite in the sanctuary. So I quit singing, and I couldn't wait for the song to end so I could sit down and just kind of stew in my silence. <clears throat> 
In short, I did not have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Now, I should clarify, I was not questioning my salvation or my right standing with God. I knew that because of the perfect obedience of Christ on my behalf at the cross, when the Father viewed me, he viewed me as pure and righteous. I had right standing with the Father. I didn't stop being a child of God, adopted into the family of God, but I was a disobedient child. Now, in these past few moments of self-disclosure, I suspect that some of you, perhaps many of you, were nodding inwardly because you have been there. There have been times when it's not been well with your soul. You have felt, in a profound way, the dark night of the soul. If you felt that dark night of the soul, and you wondered if you would once more see spiritual daylight, well, I have good news for you this morning. If you, if you experience that despair, and if there's truth in the adage that misery loves company, look around. Because all of us are suffering to various degrees. We're all hurting in various degrees, and the church is the right place for us to be. St. Augustine, the great bishop of Hippo Regis in North Africa, in the fifth century once said that the church is rather like a hospital. It's full of sick people who are desperately hoping to be cured. Now before we look this morning at our text in Psalm 13, I want to broaden this theme by telling you of a brother in Christ who experienced this dark night of the soul. I think we can all profit from his experience, and that's why I'm sharing this story with you. It's been said that the church is where beggars tell other beggars where to find a piece of bread, a piece of spiritual bread that relieves the hunger of the soul. Now, Erskine Theological Seminary, my employer, has a contract with the U.S. military, I guess the Department of Defense, to teach chaplains. And these chaplains are on our campus the month of January and one of the summer months over a period of, th of three years. And as a part of their Doctor of Ministry curriculum, they write a project dissertation that relates to some role they have as a military chaplain. I recently served as a second reader on one of these dissertations. That was actually quite interesting, which is a rarity. This particular chaplain came to us especially well prepared. He had an MBA from University of Southern California. He had a Master of Divinity from Princeton Seminary. The author had served several tours of duty in Kuwait, in Iraq, and in Afghanistan. And it was his time in Iraq that proved especially traumatic. He lost two of his closest friends. He survived, fortunately, several explosive, uh, improvised explosive devices. And he also witnessed, though he wasn't in the firefight, he witnessed a battle where some non-combatants, some innocent women and children were killed. After 13 months in Iraq, he returned to his wife and his two children in Southern California but he was a profoundly changed man. He, f he suffered insomnia, and when he did sleep, he had terrible nightmares. And though he was surrounded by his family and those that he loved, he felt terrible isolation, loneliness, and despair relating to the grief that he continued to suffer. He went to the VA hospital and received extensive counseling, and the therapist recognized that he truly was suffering, and he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. This is a relatively new label for this malady that our servicemen and women have experienced in wars. The label emerged after Vietnam. In previous wars, this malady was called combat fatigue, 
It's been called Shell Shock. And the name that resonates with me is the label Soldier's Heart. In his own recovery from PTSD, this chaplain became very interested in the disorder and the approach that the military was using to treat other veterans who were similarly diagnosed. And his ongoing interest in this topic and his admission into the MedCom Doctor of Ministry program at Erskine gave him the perfect opportunity to study this topic with some intensity uh, and to explore it as a dissertation topic. His goal was to offer the military a better and more effective approach to treating veterans who are diagnosed with PTSD. What he discovered was that the military doctors, the therapists, the psychiatrists were offering at best an incomplete means of healing. Part of it was they were squeamish about the supposed separation of church and state fears. And they were particularly ill-equipped to help veterans deal with spiritual issues. And this is where chaplains, this author believed, could play a key role because they could raise spiritual issues. The author of this dissertation, Chaplain Mark Lee, came to recognize that there was a common factor of all of the veterans who had been diagnosed with PTSD. They share some common elements. It's an issue that's found repeatedly in the Bible. It has a rather technical name by theologians and ethicists and philosophers. It's called the problem of theodicy. It's the age-old issue of good and evil. If, in short, if God is good, why is there evil in the world? Or as Rabbi Harold Kushner said in his best-selling book some 30, maybe 35 years ago, why do bad things happen to good people? Now, without being glib, when we Reformed Christians hear that question, and it's a very good question, without being glib, we respond and say, what good people? We're all sinners. None of us are good. So the whole idea of good people and innocent people is not what the Bible teaches. You see, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It's innate. We inherited the original sin of Adam and Eve. I remember when I was in graduate school surrounded by humanists, don't remember what the topic was, but the professor made this sort of offhanded comment about some social problem. He said, you know, class, there are still some people in this world who believe in original sin. And I took that in, and I watched with amazement as my hand went up. I thought, this is interesting. I want to hear what I'm going to say. And I said, Dr. Galishloff, I said, I believe in original sin. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe it goes a long way in explaining man's inhumanity to man. G.K. Chesterton once said, the only demonstrable Christian doctrine is original sin. Just read the headlines. Well, he kind of sputtered and said, well... As I said, some people still believe in original sin. Apparently, you're one of them. <laughs> Theodicy is an intellectual defense of God in the face of evil and suffering. And this issue, Chaplain Lee believes, was never addressed or addressed adequately by non-Christian therapists and doctors, because they did not believe that we live in a fallen world, a world that's broken by sin. They might also argue that questions like that were above their pay grade. The chaplain Mark Lee believes that treatment of PTSD must be holistic. It must address the mental, the physical, and most importantly, the spiritual. True healing, he believes, contains the curriculum that contains two components. 
First of all, Chaplain Lee argues that we must immerse ourselves in learning about the suffering of Christ on the cross. And secondly, he says, there will be no true healing unless a person embraces the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Chaplain Lee argues that PTSD is not so much a disease of the mind, but it's an injury of the soul that has left a deep scar. Of course, this is an age-old problem in response to human suffering in the trenches of World War I, and then 20 years later, the extermination camps of Nazi Germany in World War II, a movement arose in Europe in the 20th century called protest atheism. Now, <clears throat> I'll be in the 11 o'clock service, and I, I don't know, but I suspect that we will probably recite the Apostles' Creed, perhaps the Nicene Creed. It is part of our belief system. Christian, what do you believe? And we recite the Apostles' Creed. This is the creed, if you will, of protest atheism, their declaration of faith. <clears throat> Quote, we cannot believe in a God who stays safely in heaven while all this suffering goes on. We cannot take that sort of God seriously. If he doesn't know what it's like to suffer, he cannot know anything about us. End quote. But you see, therein lies the fatal flaw with that kind of protest. The Bible makes it very clear that God does indeed know what it is like to suffer. He sent his only son, his innocent, sinless son, to suffer and die for our sins. Now, I want us to look at two passages of Scripture this morning, an Old Testament prophetic text and a New Testament text. And what we will see, I'll alert you to it before we read it, and I'll remind us of it after we have read it. What we will see is a close relationship between suffering and redemption. It's clearly brought out in the passage that is commonly called the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. So I invite you to turn, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 53. The Son of God was innocent, yet he suffered on behalf of the guilty. And through his suffering, others will be healed spiritually. We're going to read selected verses here from Psalm, uh, rather from Isaiah chapter 52. I was preaching a year ago outside of Atlanta, and uh, you know, the elders told me, <clears throat> always a little bit uncomfortable doing this, but I did what they told me to do. They said, after you preach, go out to the front of the church and greet people, or I guess de-greet people as they leave. <laughs> well, I've, you know, I've done that. It's a common practice. But as you see, see people coming, you read their body language and the look on their face. They're looking for some escape route. They don't want to talk to you. Some of them are thinking, now what can I possibly say that's positive? The sermon was a bomb, I can't go there. Uh, and so, you know, they, they make their way up to me, they take my hand, look me in the eye and say, I sure like that tie. <laughs> well, this man, elderly man approached me and he said, young man? I said, yes sir. He said, when you announce a text of scripture, give us time to find it. <laughs> and I like your tie. <laughs> now, I've announced uh, Isaiah 53, and I've stalled here. I've given you time to find it. So Isaiah 53, we'll read verses 3 through 6 and verse 12. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up 
our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, New Testament writers believe that this prophecy that we just read in part was, of course, fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Look, for example, at 1 Peter chapter 2. It makes this very clear. It spells it out. 1 Peter Chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. That's a quotation from the suffering servant passage, Isaiah 52 and 53. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. You know, the sufferings of Jesus on the cross were not pointless. They were not accidental, but they were the mysterious and wonderful means by which God was working out the salvation of his people. We must remember there is no resurrection without suffering. There is no resurrection without suffering in the cross. In short, we will not fully recognize the generosity of a gracious God until we recognize our own sin. And that is the message of Romans 8, 17. Quote, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, suffering is a mystery, and it causes anguish for many Christians. It seems to call into question the love of God and the goodness of God, the generosity of God. The suffering of Jesus on the cross, it does not explain suffering, but it does reveal that God himself is willing to allow himself to be subject to all the pain and the suffering that his creation experiences. And I think that's the bigger view, the wider view of the generosity of God. God became the man of suffering so that we can enter into the mystery of death and resurrection. According to Chaplain Lee, this message is crucial in dealing with veterans who have been diagnosed with PTSD to help them heal the injury of the soul that they have suffered. There's a famous saying about the medical profession, I think, that is fitting here. Quote, only the wounded physician can heal. The God who offers to heal the wounds of our sin has himself been wounded by sinners. Not only is a Christian response to suffering important to those who have suffered an injury of the soul, but secondly, Chaplain Lee argues that we must embrace and seek to understand the sovereignty of God. It's essential in the healing process. Now, every serious Christian that I have ever met wants to embrace the doctrine of sovereignty of God. But when the rubber meets the road, I find that we are all at varying degrees of inconsistency regarding sovereignty. 
For example, Calvinists and Arminians love to proclaim the sovereignty of God, but Arminians proclaim that sovereignty of God except when it gets to salvation, in which case man becomes sovereign. Man apparently has the free will, they argue, to accept or reject. In their theology, God is sovereign until it comes to salvation when all of a sudden man becomes sovereign and has veto power. Well, that's a very inconsistent view of sovereignty. Here's another inconsistency regarding our belief in sovereignty. We love to proclaim the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in the good times, don't we? Times of triumph. Not so much in times of tragedy. But if we truly believe that God is sovereign and all-wise, all-knowing and infinite and in his mercy and goodness and truth and in his generosity, then we must also accept the hard truths of sovereignty. The generosity of God means that God is not just in the rainbow and the gentle breezes and the sunshine. He's also in the tornado and in the hurricanes and in the tsunamis. For his own purposes and his own glory, he is in those events of life that in our finite creaturely perspective, we rightly call tragedy. But the hard truth of sovereignty is that in the economy of God, there is no such thing as tragedy. Oftentimes we don't understand the ways of God, but in our sorrow and in our tears, we still trust and say that God is good. Now this is the message that Chaplain Lee says is a means to healing veterans who are suffering with PTSD because frankly it's the message of the Bible. Think, for example, in the Old Testament of Job. Job understood the hard truths of sovereignty. Job chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that Job was the greatest man among all of the people in the East. And in a time when wealth was measured by livestock, Job owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. But Job could not understand why his entire world collapsed and he lost his possessions and many of those that he loved. And then, of course, Job is counseled by his wife. We read about this in Job 2.9. She says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Despite that advice, however well intended, in the next, very next verse, Job says to his wife, what you are saying is foolish. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? You see, the book of Job frankly insists that suffering and tragedy falls within the sweep of God's sovereignty. God gave Satan permission to afflict Job. It's not by accident. It's not by fate. Job wasn't simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. It wasn't a bad roll of the dice. It was at God's hand for his own purposes. In the Old Testament, David also suffered the same sorrow and lament and despair. In fact, fully one-third of the Psalms fit under the category of Psalms of lament or complaint. We could choose from any number of psalms to illustrate this. I've chosen Psalm 13, written by David under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. We know that much of David's suffering, of course, was generated by his own sin, his own willful disobedience as an adulterer and as a murderer. And yet, God calls David a man after his own heart. In this short psalm of six verses that we read a few moments ago, David reaches the near depth of despair. It's a desperate plea for deliverance. Martin Luther, 
calls the mood of this prayer the state in which hope despairs. It seems that in verses 1 and 2, God is hidden. God is withdrawn. And he cannot be found. It leads David to a fear of abandonment because four times in this psalm, David cries out, How long, O Lord? How long will you forget me forever? Without divine intervention, David can only anticipate defeat and death. Because the image here is one of imminent collapse. God is absent, or so it seems. He's experiencing the dark night of the soul. We've all experienced that. We've all been there. A number of years ago, I, I taught at Southern Wesleyan University. I, I taught there 14 years, and there was a faculty member who joined the faculty the uh, same time that I did, 1987, Jim Bowen, and he and I became best friends. He's still my closest friend, and as we were friends, our wives became friends, and we socialized a lot, and not too many years into that friendship, Jim's wife, Sharon was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. It's the disease that eventually took her life, leaving a husband and three children. After her diagnosis, she continued taking classes at the university as long as she could, as she was physically able. And throughout that ordeal, Jim and Sharon would ask their pastor, they'd ask Theologians, they'd ask anyone who would listen, why? Sharon would ask, why, why am I dying in my mid-30s? Sharon was enrolled in a class titled Basic Christian Beliefs. And among the textbooks, they were using two by Paul Little, published by University Press. Many of you probably read them and, and probably own them. One is titled Know What You Believe, there's a companion volume that's titled, Know Why You Believe. And they were popularly used, they're easy reads, and they were known on campus as the what and the why books. One morning in the busyness of getting ready to leave the house in order to go to her class, Sharon could not find all of her books, and she called out to her family to help her find one of her books. She said, I've got my what, but I can't find my why. Now, isn't that a good commentary on life? How many times in the face of tragedy do we ask that question, why? We can't always find our why. Why are we suffering? Why does God seem absent? Why am I dying? Why do bad things happen to seemingly good people? We can't seem to find our why. Perhaps this morning you're feeling absent from God. God seems distant. Your prayers go no higher than the ceiling. Your relationship with God has grown cold. You know, there's a story of a husband and wife who are driving down the road, and they're hugging their respective sides of the car. And the wife says to her husband, Look at us! You know, when we were dating... We basically occupied one seat, and look at us now. There's this huge chasm between us. What has happened? And the husband said, I didn't move. Now, I'm not blaming this on the woman. That's not my point, though it probably is her fault. But uh, <laughs> if you're feeling distant or estranged from God, remember, God has not moved. God, the creator of the universe, the redeemer, the sustainer, the generous God of grace has not moved. The wonderful news of this short psalm this morning, Psalm 13, is that it concludes very abruptly, very suddenly, in an unanticipated expression of trust and joy and praise and even song to God. The tenor of the psalm changes dramatically in verse 5. 
And we move from agony to ecstasy. Notice that the sorrow, if you have your Bible open, notice that the sorrow in David's heart, verse 2, has been replaced by a heart that shall rejoice, in verse 4. Whereas the enemy has been exalted over me, verse 2, now in verse 6, God has dealt bountifully with me. When we consider the generosity of God, as we've been doing in this series, we must consider the bigger picture. The ambiguity and the complexity of this psalm accurately reflects, I think, the ambiguity and the complexity of our life of faith. As people of faith, we'll always find it necessary to pray, how long, O Lord, even as we simultaneously profess that the Lord has been good to me. In holding together, as this psalm does, complaint and praise in this tension, we are taught about both God and about ourselves. God is involved in all of life, even in life at its worst. In fact, this helps us to explain God's involvement in the, even in the apparently God-forsaken event like the crucifixion. It's part of God's divine plan. We are simultaneously confronted with our own perpetual neediness and comforted by God's unfailing love. The agony and the ecstasy in this psalm belong together because we are simultaneously people of the cross and people of the resurrection. Psalm 13 reminds us that there is no following Jesus without bearing a cross, according to Mark 8.34. And those who lose their life for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it, Mark 8.35. On the authority of the word of God, Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, your mourning can turn to dancing. Because of the generosity of God, I urge you this morning to turn to the Father who will never forget his covenant obligations to his people. It's very interesting, the noun for help and deliverance and salvation in verse 5 shares the same Hebrew root for Yahweh. Literally, Yahweh is salvation. That's why David's countenance can change. He recognizes who God is and the goodness, the grace, and the mercy, and the generosity of God. So I pray that we can all say without reservation, God is good all the time. All of the time, God is good. In closing, listen to these last two verses of Psalm 13. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Because we worship and serve a generous God, I hope we can all say, without reservation, it is well with my soul. Amen.